I'm not having fun playing Yu-Gi-Oh. I'm filming this at like 2 a.m. This is a little more improvisational than a lot of the stuff on this channel, but that's because if I wrote down how I felt about this and then read it off a script, I would quit Yu-Gi-Oh. So as you can probably tell by the title of this video, this is going to be a big, long-winded third. This was pre-list complaining. Adjective, okay. hypocritical, rant-sona type piece of content. It's fine. Honestly, I just want to eat my food in peace right now. <laughs> I just want to finish my food, so... Tell me what you were complaining about. Then I'm gonna do some of these. Yeah, just doing it for you. Yeah, it's also kind of weird because, like, not only do I make a living off of playing Yu-Gi-Oh and making videos about it, but I've also consistently gotten in front of people who say that it sucks now and that it used to be epic. Anyway, here's my video about how Yu-Gi-Oh sucks now and it used to be epic. So just a quick aside, if you're unfamiliar with me, first off, that means the video is appearing in your recommended box and I am not just talking to the same 40 or 50,000 people that I usually spew my little diatribes at. That's good, I guess. And second is I'm in kind of a unique Yu-Gi-Oh position. I've been playing Yu-Gi-Oh since the very start. Um, I'm always looking for new ways to enjoy the game. I will play literally any format, historic or fan or uh, things like Speed Duel or Rush Duel. And I've also played literally every format in Yu-Gi-Oh's history in some capacity. Now that the show that I'm a part of, History of Yu-Gi-Oh, has reached the point at which I started playing Yu-Gi-Oh pretty competitively. So I can say with at least a little bit of authority that this format is not good. Not good for reasons that aren't just like temporal, but reveal a sort of like frog in the pot shift about how we play the game that has resulted in a format that's just sort of perpetually in crisis. At the 250th YCS in London, I showed up playing a deck that wasn't particularly competitive, but I liked and did way better than I thought I would. And I thought, okay, this is going to light a fire under me. I can't wait to actually get good enough at the game that I can start topping YCSs. I'm going to put in the hours. And I sat down to play Cash Tira for YCS Philly, and I, I really dissipated within a matter of days. That's like an awful place to be in, right? When people whose job it is to play this game for a living don't want to play the game anymore. Anyway, let's talk about why. First, the meta. It sucks. Yes, the metagame is diverse in a sense. Uh, one of probably like 10 different decks could probably win you a national or an equivalent tournament. But when you look at overall play rate percentages, it is clear a uh, cash tier is really the only game in town. Yu-Gi-Oh! players have like a worm in their brain that tells them you need to be quantifying tier zero formats, classifying them only if a deck gets 65% representation at top cuts. But there have been a lot of high level tournaments recently where Cash Tira has fulfilled that condition. I personally think that describing formats in that way isn't particularly helpful. And a true tier zero format is one in which you are absolutely deck building for one deck in particular and nothing else. I don't think we're there with cash. But I do think the cash tier is a fucking miserable deck to be occupying the top spot. Yes, the deck has this like one in 1000 chance to lock nine of your zones, but more important than all of that is their main boss monster, Arise Heart. He's a big macro cosmos, which turns off like 60% of all Yu-Gi-Oh cards ever printed. He also creates these really frustrating game states to keep track of where every time anyone activates anything, you have to do this little side quest where you attach a card from the banished zone to a rise hard as chain link one because it's a mandatory ability. It's like a flu style gameplay where you're building a chain constantly. And the card is super over centralizing. Decks absolutely have to have a game plan that beats exactly a rise hard or they will be losing to exactly a rise hard. In my opinion, the most frustrating part about Arise Heart is that the cards that beat it, which is largely stuff like Korikaras and Kaijus, beat it into the fucking sun. It's at this weird nexus of card that's so individually powerful that the entire format has to warp around it, and card with so little protection that as soon as the format warps around it, games are just going to be decided on if you drew the out or not. Which brings me to skill expression in current Yu-Gi-Oh. So as a bit of background, Alex and I have been playing a lot of 2017 format for History of Yu-Gi-Oh. This year of Yu-Gi-Oh was largely dominated by exactly Zodiac. In the first couple of months, it really has no peer. Uh, Zodiac Pure is an incredibly powerful deck, and the mirror is pretty involved. There's some other decks that are popular and powerful around that time as well. Paleozoic, both 60 card and 40 card variants. Metal Foes Zoo, which can be both a combo deck and a sort of deck with inevitability, which decks like Zoo largely lacked. Invoked Artifact Wind Witch, and a significant amount of decks that are playing Zoo, but also supplementing it with other engines, things like Infernoid Zoo. Are One thing that just came to my mind, doesn't necessarily have to do something with the point right now, but something he said earlier. Uh, is I do feel, I do understand where he's coming from when he says it's weird sometimes for him to uh, quote-unquote be forced to play Yu-Gi-Oh, right? 
when uh because it's his job right uh and i feel the same way not about content creation but i've always felt that way about competitive Yu-Gi-Oh in, in in general because even before i did content creation even before this was my job basically playing competitive Yu-Gi-Oh has something i've always been doing and it was never i was never the type of person to be like hey i don't like this certain format i'm not gonna try as hard or i'm not gonna go to this tournament for me it's it's kind of like it's part of my identity that if there's a ycs like in europe i go right i don't question it of like hey is the format cool is 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 whatever like do i do i like this or that it's just like i i do go right and sometimes forcing yourself to play it's it can make you feel bad when like it, it would theoretically be so easy to be like, hey, I don't like this format. I'm not going to take part. You know what I mean? The same the same goes for the, the Master Duel World Championship Qualifier. Right? It, it's the same exact... It's the same exact example of like, I don't agree with the tournament structure at all. This is miserable, right? Best of one 70, for 72 hours, all that type of stuff it's a miserable thing and i'm sitting there and i'm like i kind i don't really want to do this right and but i'm like i have to right i have to not because i'm i have to stream it but because my competitive mindset just is like i i have no choice i have to do that right um and like i i can definitely see why that's that's hard sometimes right because you might uh, you might you you feel forced to do a certain thing it's always different, right? Like it's it's different whether you do something because you want to do it or you do something because you are quote unquote forced to do it. They're not the same thing, right? Like it, this this is why very often um, I I do have fun playing Yu-Gi-Oh, but I have the most fun playing Yu-Gi-Oh when I'm not try try harding basically. Like I have the most fun playing like historic formats. I have the most fun playing something like Cube. I love playing Cube. Those, that type of things, right? Those type of things are the ones that I enjoy way more, but they are not the ones that, you know, fulfill me from, like, the competitive side of things, right? It's like, I am a competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! player for, like, by heart. I, I love all those other things, all those other formats. I, I, I love them to death, but they are not what I, I identify as, basically. I don't know if, if that makes sense. I don't know if people... If, if, if that's something that everyone even understands. I feel like not everyone is like that uh, when it comes to, you know. Like another example is when they introduced the world's points for the first time, right? When they introduced the world's points for the first time in 2017, it was basically like you get points for regionals and nationals and first place in Germany gets to go to worlds. When they announced that, my whole my year was gone basically my year 2017 was gone i think i played more like i spent more weekends at regionals than i spent weekends at home which is not something i i i would do by like i like playing Yu-Gi-Oh, but it's not something i usually do right yeah but i don't i don't have a choice i didn't have a choice back then that's not how i work right I, I flew to I I flew to America to play regionals. I have at that point in time I had never been to the to to the USA ever to play a YCS or whatever, but I flew there to play two regionals on on one weekend. I played YC I, I played a regional in Seattle and I played a regional in uh, California. And, uh, like, I, I played the regional on Saturday, and then on from Saturday to Sunday, I didn't even have a hotel. I flew in the night from Seattle to, uh, to California to play another regional on Sunday. Not because I wanted to do that. Right? And, like, sometimes... Did you top? I, I think I topped Seattle regional. I won, I won California regional, yeah. I won California regional, but it's like, it's, yeah, I mean, I, I am happy about, about this hobby, like, um, uh, and everything and all the friends I've made along the way, but sometimes, sometimes I do feel like it's, 
very much like, uh, you know. It was, no, it's not, it was Zodiac, Paleo, Draco format. Very popular. Anyway, without spoiling too much about the next couple of episodes of the history of Yu-Gi-Oh, there is so much going on in these games. We have like double digit games in the next two or three weeks that go to turn 15, and we are both in it the entire time. Now I want you to sit down and ask yourself, when was the last time something like that happened? Would you do it again? Of course I'd do it again. It's not even a question. If they, if the world point system was still the same as it was back then, if you got a guaranteed spot for first in Germany, yeah. Happened to you. I've been testing my ass off for this format, and I can count on one hand the number of games that I've played that have gone to like turn five. For the last five or six years, there's been a weird arms race in Yu-Gi-Oh. Individual cards do so much, they often represent an end board on their own. Think Cash Tier or Unicorn, for instance. So as a result, the cards that beat those cards have to be unbelievably powerful in order to counteract something that strong. Which means that in turn, end boards have to become more and more comprehensive, necessitating even more comprehensive answers, necessitating even more powerful end boards. We've gotten to a point in Yu-Gi-Oh where the cards that beat certain strategies are unbelievable. Karikara, Nibiru, Droll, Shifter, Kaijus, Dimensional Barrier. I've talked about this before. This specific issue is something that they are leveling each other. Instead of creating, instead of designing healthy archetypes, they're creating more and more powerful archetypes. And then they're creating more and more powerful answers to that. So people stop complaining about the archetypes. And I think this leveling, I don't think it works forever. I think at some point you hit a threshold where it's like, you can't make more powerful answers than the ones we already have. Cause like, I the, the I think my favorite example of this, my favorite exam example of this is how flexible you are with, uh, with outing, with tributing your opponent's stuff. If your opponent's deck summons one boss monster, you can kaiju them. If your opponent's deck summons two boss monsters, you can lava golem. If they summon three, use sphere mode. If they summon even more, they probably lose to Nibiru or Kurikara, right? At some point, you know, the only thing they can do more than that is make like a monster that can tribute an adjustable amount of stuff, which basically Kurikara is that, right? So it's like, I think at some point, at some point they have to work on it from a game design perspective rather than a um just i'm gonna make more and more powerful things at some point they have to slow down and realize hey we can't do that forever it doesn't work until infinity because at, at some point it's just gonna be hey do you have that card that is such an insane answer to my board or do you not right and i think we're getting closer to that point Functionally, all of these cards read win the game, and their activation conditions for the most part can't be played around. Sure, like you can not Shangri Era, but you're still losing a Rise Heart off of a Kurikara when the mandatory effect triggers. As a result, getting good at a format often has very little to do with actual gameplay and everything to do with reading your opponent, peering into their soul, determining if they have a blowout, and then deciding if it's one of those blowouts you could play around or one of those blowouts you can't. That is a skill for sure, but I'd much rather cultivate something like in-game decision-making than staring. Oh, I can tell by the way he scratched his nose. He's holding an abiru. Like that sucks. That's poker shit. That sucks. Which brings me to card design. I've started to kind of dread games two and three now. More often than not, they feel like they're decided by lingering floodgate bullshit you can't plan around. If I'm on super heavy samurai, I can guarantee Droll is going to make an appearance. If I'm on pearly, I know the shifter's coming and I better have drawn gamma or that's it. These lingering floodgate hand traps and these big fucking blowouts often make the game feel like go fish. Got any curry kara? Go fish, Mr. Fox. Got any Droll? Not a one, sir. Go fish. I sat down to try to figure out when it felt like Yu-Gi-Oh shifted from what it was to what it is now. And I think it must have been around 2018 when people were playing that Goki U-Link deck. If you're unfamiliar, that list summoned a billion monsters and then ended on Topologic Gumblar Dragon taking four cards out of your hand. To beat that deck, you had to draw the out. And if you drew the out and retained the out after the Gumblar, you won the game. If you did not, you lost. And while that deck was completely unfair and did get hit pretty quickly, I couldn't help but think, 
how many formats since follow the exact same gameplay loop? A first turn where your opponent sets up, a subsequent turn where you reveal if you have drawn the out or not, and then a scoop from the opponent if they didn't draw the out for your out. This isn't just combo decks either. Even slow decks like Sky Striker can get off to an insurmountable advantage unless you draw the out post board, something like an anti sp Why is Shifter still legal? You know what the biggest problem is? And I realize that every time when I'm making arguments like this is that both of those things are problems. I think the, the, the broken turn one boards are a problem and the broken cards to deal with those turn one boards are also a problem. And another issue that we have when we talk about these things is that both of these things kind of validate each other, right? The, everyone is like, oh, we need those broken go second cards because if, if we don't have those broken board breakers and whatever, how do we deal with this, you know? And then the combo players or whatever, or like the people that defend the good going first stuff, the good cards for going first, um, they're like, well, with all those broken, like, you know, N Nibiru, uh, Evenly, Dark Ruler, of course my combos have to be strong, right? Because otherwise, you know, if my deck doesn't put up Omni Negates, I'm just getting blown out, right? What's the point? What's the point if 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 my deck doesn't have a negate for Nibiru? It doesn't, it's not a valid deck, right? You know what I mean? So it's like both of those things simultaneously, we realize they are problems, but you can't have, like, basically they... They both exist together and they do make sense together. That's the problem, right? Like broken board breakers make sense because the boards are too strong otherwise. So you, what you, what you would have to do, um, what you would have to do is you would have to address both in the same way, right? Um, and that's a hard thing to do. That's basically what I that's what I basically was trying to do when I made that big ban list, that hypothetical ban list. That's the point I was trying to make is that you can't just get rid of a few things and then expect the game to be fine. You'd have to basically the problem has a lot of roots. Right? It's not just one or two things that you need to get rid of and then you're fine, right? I think that's been proven time and time again in the last couple of years that like, oh, if they just remove scythe now, then we're fine. Nah. That's not how it works, right? And uh, at once again, this all sounds like extremely negative, right? But I still think Yu-Gi-Oh! is a very good game. There's still a large portion of games where you can play around certain cards. And a lot of it already happens in deck building, right? There's a lot of decks that don't work like that. And a lot of games where you do have good gameplay, right? It still is a good game overall, but it's going into a direction where... Um, these problems exist and i think as a community we should normalize uh talking about them in a in a you know friendly and logical manner because if you're interested in the future of the game or the game having a bright future even small problems or like uh, whatever they need to be addressed because they can spiral out of control right which you know can definitely happen Bell Fragrance, and then they have to draw the out for your out, a mystical space typhoon or something. It just sucks. It takes a game that's well known for being a vehicle for storytelling and condenses the whole thing down into a turn and a half. Just going through some of the top decks with Cash Tira. Frequently, the game feels like it boils down to if your opponent can't out your big macro cosmos, you've deaded 90% of the cards in their deck and you win instantly. If they've drawn the out, then you lose instantly. Super Heavy Samurai often feels like a race to a lingering floodgate hand trap, either something like Shifter or something like Droll and Lockbird, the absence of which is your opponent failing to draw the out for your big board that absolutely kills them. Pearly is a deck that often feels like it wins or loses based on the back of your opponent has opened a Kaiju. This one isn't as bad because they have built in archetype ways that you can recoup some of the losses and mechanisms by which you don't actually die on the spot. Math Max power is almost entirely concentrated in Super Factorial. If your opponent can push through it, they win. If they can't, you do. Branded is just Gimmick Puppet at this point. This is a massive oversimplification, of course. In Cash Tira, for instance, there's a lot of games that reduce down to Fenrir control, and those are interesting and do have a lot of back and forth, but they are far and away the minority. My experience is that a significant amount of Cash Tira games are determined by playing Go Fish. What a fun game this is. Which brings me to something I think would alleviate a lot of the problems with this type of card design, which is communication. Wah, wah, where ban list. Da, 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 da. 
Okay, but really, where ban list? I think I could forgive a significant amount of this if Konami was discussing with the player base ever what their design goals are, what they want Yu-Gi-Oh to be, how they expect the format to shake out, what cool stuff you can do in upcoming sets. Right now, it feels like the only communication the wider player base has with Konami is that Konami contacted some content creators to make videos explaining how to get to Worlds through Master Duel three quarters of the way through the Master Duel. Bro, I don't think, uh, I don't think those videos even truly said how you get to worlds <laughs> there's no way they said hey yeah if you want to go to worlds you need to play 72 hours straight basically and uh and that's how you get there <laughs> cool event in which you could get to worlds they're not talking to us about goals for the format they're not talking to us about what the future of Yu-Gi-Oh is going to look like they're not even fucking giving us ban list dates like it's unbelievable that it says a few months from now right i feel like i'm going crazy I want more than anything to hear discussion from card designers about the cards they're designing. Like Arise Heart, for instance. Is it being intentionally made the way it is? Is this gameplay loop what Konami wants? Can we expect this for the future of Yu-Gi-Oh? Is this Do they communicate with the community better over in the OCG? Um, I don't know. I, I don't want to say yes, I don't want to say no, because I I do not know. We we typically have some OCG um, experts in chat. If, if anyone knows, then, you know. It's an anomaly. What's the plan? I really can't stress this enough coming from a Magic the Gathering background. The fact that we have no insight as to what the developers of Yu-Gi-Oh! want is unbelievable. It is not common to hear radio silence from a company whose bottom line depends on the goodwill of the player base. It's weird. Which brings me to... What's gonna happen? Nothing. Yu-Gi-Oh! is going to continue to be run in this way until it inevitably collapses in the year 2090 when cardboard becomes more precious than water. Yu-Gi-Oh! players will put up with anything, at least in part because of creators like me, who when faced with criticism will get out in front of it to defend the card game they love. And I don't see a way out for us either. I think if Yu-Gi-Oh! starts losing money, Konami isn't going to restructure how the game is designed, they're gonna can it. But in a best of all possible worlds, Here's how it could be fixed. Print better cards. I think the cat's out of the bag when it comes to answers. When you can look at a card like Dark Ruler No More and decide that it is not the right fit for a current format, something's gone miserably wrong. Honestly, I know I'm gonna get shit for this, but this is why I liked Tier. There are a significant amount of cards that you would expect against Tier to just read Win the Game, Dimension Shifter and the like, and they just didn't. Tier was more than capable of normal summoning one tier limit monster, setting a Celiac and a Crime and passing, or making a Baguska and waiting out the shifter activation. It was a deck that theoretically could answer anything with engine. And as a result, games very infrequently ended with one player making some amazing board that couldn't be outed under any circumstances and the other opening Bad take, IMO. Uh, it's This is absolutely not a bad take. Tier limit was a very healthy deck in general in terms of just um good Yu-Gi-Oh! Tier Limit mirror matches are good Yu-Gi-Oh! Um the problem with Tier Limit format is that the Yu-Gi-Oh! community does not like formats where there's just one deck. Some people do, but in general, that is not a very healthy practice when it comes to a card game, and I understand that. Even though I liked Tier Limit format as well, I think it is not good to have a format in a card game where there's only one viable deck, because I don't think people like when Konami tells them you have to play this deck. I don't think that's a very healthy approach. My take on Tier Limit is that Tier Limit was good for the game. The problem was that Tier Limit was so strong, even though its interactions were healthy, the fact that it was the only option was, was what hurt it the most. What we needed at the time of tier limit was other decks at the same power level without being degenerate we needed we needed more decks that were on the same wavelength of tier limit basically which is kind of weird because it basically means that we needed like more power creep in that sense right we needed other decks that, because what tier limit did was basically it it was so powerful that it even it didn't even care about certain floodgates like like shifter or whatever because it was such a flexible deck that it could even it could make a rank four baguska to beat the shifter decks it had pearl rhino to beat floodgates and so on and so forth it was just it was super 
flexible and super adjustable to all these types of non-fun type of things it could play around evenly it wasn't dark cooler wasn't good against it because you had back row it was just overall it had it even had built-in hand traps so that you wouldn't get completely like overwhelmed going second by a combo deck you had hand traps in your engine uh all those things are i think good ideas I think those are good ideas. I like I like when they make decks that have in-engine outs to floodgates. I like that. I like when I have cards in my deck that are good going second, right? Making in-engine cards that are good going second is is a good thing. It's a it's a very powerful thing, but it's good. It's a great idea to make cards that are in your deck that are also good when you go first, but they are also good when you go second. Those are great designs. Like Havness even though yes milling is kind of like a it's kind of like a not a great system but the idea of halfness was 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 great right the idea of halfness is great the idea of pearl or rhino even though pearl or rhino is an incredibly overtuned card the idea of pearl or rhino is awesome the fact that you have an in-engine card that outs floodgates is is phenomenal those are all things that are good about tier that people don't realize were good because all they see is Oh, Tier Limit was the best deck by far. I was forced to play it if I wanted to compete. Therefore, bad. Which, don't worry, I understand that. I see where you're coming from. I agree, that is a bad thing. Right? Tier 0 formats can have good gameplay, but in general, I still think it's been proven time and time again that Tier 0 formats are not good. It's not a good thing if everyone is forced to play the same deck because there's too many people that don't like that. And I can get, I, I, I get that. I think that's fine. I think it's okay to have that opinion. Absolutely. But still, looking at it, looking beyond that, beyond the fact that it was a tier zero deck, um, tier limit was a deck that encouraged, encouraged a lot of healthy interaction. Right? And so my point is, if we had tier limit alongside other archetypes, that are that would would have been the same power level it would have been great right imagine a format where tier limit is at full power but there is one or two other uh decks that have the same power level without playing floodgates or whatever they work differently i don't know it's something that doesn't exist i can't make it up on the spot right now but what if there were two or three other options that would have been the same power level but just different decks right and that would have been great would love to see full power tier versus cash what are you talking about we have we had that we had that toss format basically toss format is a great example of this right toss format had three or four really good decks that all had relatively healthy interactions with each other and uh, they were all almost at the same power level. And so that was, uh, that was a totally fine format. The out and instantly winning the game on the spot. It sucks that it was a tier zero format. I understand that. I think the solution is to print more archetypes that are as good as tier element instead of reducing the game back down to go fish. Anyway, it's like 2.30 AM now, so I'm gonna wrap this up. I should note, I don't feel burnt out at all. I still love playing Yu-Gi-Oh. I have a ton of fun making the 10 minute testings, the Twitter threads, which are basically just a vehicle to reminisce about the good times we've all had playing this game, and the jank banks in which you all show me what you're excited about playing. I just can't muster the same type of excitement about the TCG right now. And that sucks because it's basically the only way to play Yu-Gi-Oh. For now. That's right, this whole thing was a promo for the rotation series coming soon. That's it, bye bye. <laughs> That's also some other thing I should probably add is even though I have criticism like this about Yu-Gi-Oh! It's still, it's not even close. I still love to play this game. And I will, I am one of those people that I will put up with all of this stuff, right? I will pull up, I will put up with all of these problems and issues. I always have. I, I love this game too much. I, I love playing this game too much. I always look for the positives rather than the negatives. But I think it is important to point out the things that you don't agree with. Because... Like, I mean, I only do that because I care about the, the future of the game, right? And I think that's what people always um, misunderstand when they take something too personal or when they, when they don't like a certain critique point or whatever, is that whoever is voicing their concerns about whatever in Yu-Gi-Oh, it's just because they want the game to be better, 
right? They see an opportunity on how the game could improve from their point of view, and they make that point, right? They try to, you know, and I think we have to do that, right? We have to, we have to normalize talking about Yu-Gi-Oh in that sort of way because the game has been alive for a long, long time, and we want it to be alive for much longer. And I, even though Konami doesn't communicate much, I'm pretty sure they see what's going on. If if just enough people talk about it they will eventually see that oh the community that likes this type of thing or it doesn't like that type of thing and that's all we can hope for at this point in time right we all we can hope for in this point in at this point in time is voicing our opinions in a reasonable manner and a human way and then hoping they see it eventually and enough people share your opinion you know what i mean Everyone talks about Yu-Gi-Oh like this? Yes, everyone talks about Yu-Gi-Oh. I still I don't like the way people talk to each other usually because you'll have like you'll have like people insulting each other very very fast, I feel like, which is not a Yu-Gi-Oh exclusive problem, I think. It's a I think whenever like people take stuff way too personal like, you know, without actually listening to what everyone else is saying. Like circular, look, the, the, it is actually an example of it. Like the amount of people who just called me like a salty crybaby when I criticized um, Mathmex Circular is is through the roof. Even though I think my criticism for Mathmex Circular was very very reasonable, I don't hate on Mathmex Circular because of because I just want to. I hate Mathmex Circular because of the things it represents and the video I made. I think made it very clear why. I, I thought that way. I didn't hate on it for no reason, but people acted like, you know, people acted like I, I did. The circular thing is a joke as well as criticism. I mean, it was, I, I at, at a certain point, I took it to like a humoristic level because, you know, yeah. you hated them after that top 32 match. No, I, I we've been talking about circular beforehand. It has nothing to do with that. So technically, we wouldn't need a ban list like yours, but just more power creep to the point where unfun cards won't work, which is more likely for Konami to do anyway. Theoretically, um, theoretically, that could also work. Yeah, you could make... Also, once again, very theoretically, you could just make um, decks, multiple decks that are, that are so much more powerful than the current stuff that basically that's our new metagame. As long as those more powerful decks interact with each other with each other in a healthy way, you know, in a fun way, it's fine. I, I mean, power creep is power creep is something that people always think is a completely negative thing. But at the end of the day, power creep is just a phenomenon that is a very natural thing in card games, because all it really is is cards need to get better. Um so that people are incentivized to buy them right that is all power creep is it's a very natural thing because they want to make money they need to they print new cards those cards have to be better for you to play them because otherwise they they don't make money if you can if, if the old cards are still better why would you get the new cards right simple as that that is power creep it has nothing to do with the game getting better the game getting worse uh, whatever it is, there is actually, in theory, no negative connotation to power creep. It's not inherently a bad thing. It just happens to be that when they, when the card designers are lazy, if you're lazy about creating a better card, it's very easy to create a card that's better, but it's not very easy to create a card that's better and also very fun, right? Because you can easily make a card that just says, do this or that, which basically wins you the game every time. They know, like, it's very easy to design, uh, I don't know, evenly matched, right? But evenly matched is not a very fun card, because if you activate that card going second, you would win the game. If you draw the card going first, it's completely useless. It's not a very healthy design, right? But it's a good card. You know, it's a better card than other cards. It was power creep, but it's a bad example of power creep. And then, but there's also plenty of good examples of power creep. But like, there, it's just power creep is not inherently a bad thing. What do the words healthy interaction mean? See, that's the problem also, uh, is that healthy is 
not a very, it's all of these things are not very objective things right it's like a lot of these things are not um objective they are highly subjective right like i mean some people will find this or that fun some people won't find it fun some people think hand traps are fun some people think hand traps are not fun um i i don't think there is a there's not a an easy definition for these type of things the only thing we can hope for is that we as a community can um agree on certain things being fun and certain things not being fun right i think the community has to a large extent agreed on the fact that cards that simply don't let your opponent play the game aren't very fun he i'm talking not not only talking about floodgates i'm also including stuff like making an unbreakable board uh summoning unoutable boss monsters or like locking your opponent out of playing whatever i think we've as a community agreed on the fact that this type of stuff isn't very fun i think we've also for a majority once again the majority of Yu-Gi-Oh players i don't think likes when it is like um you need to draw a very specific card and if you don't draw that card you lose the game I don't think that's a very fun interaction for either player and i think most people agree on that right the fact that like let's say your opponent makes a certain board and the only card that beats it is dark ruler no more i think we can agree and everyone can see why that's not a very fun situation because uh um if my opponent goes first and makes that in in insane crazy board let's say it's i don't know super heavy samurai right they make that insane crazy board and the only way my the opponent can win is not by playing their deck because their deck cannot play right now their deck has to have a card like evenly matched maybe sphere mode or whatever if they don't have that they lose and that's not going to feel good for them right because from their perspective they did not feel like they took part in the game and they also didn't feel like they had a chance right because they simply didn't draw that card so they couldn't play with their deck like it just didn't work right and then um if they draw the card, the the Super Heavy Samurai player is going to feel the same way. They're going to feel terrible, right? Because they all they did was do their standard combo, right? Nothing. They didn't do anything wrong. They didn't do any, anything right either. They just did the normal stuff. And the opponent didn't really work for it as well. They didn't have to skillfully play around their board. They didn't have to maneuver what they did. They just activated Dark Rule. And they just won because they drew Dark Ruler. So from the perspective of the Super Heavy Samurai player, it's also not very fun. You know what I mean? So I think um, I think there's a few things like that where, of course, we don't have a definition for fun. We don't have that. We don't have a objective definition for this card is healthy, this card is unhealthy. But we can talk about these sort of things. And come to a conclusion and be like and and voice our opinion and be like hey this sort of design i don't think is very fun right if you're if you're making decks that make powerful boards then give us like the the decks get more and more powerful at going first these days i don't think that decks are getting equally more powerful for going second you know what i mean i think that's something they should really think about more um is i like when they make cards i really think that is one way they could fix this because let me be clear i think there are definitely ways they can fix this um but one very great way to fix this with like design space is make cards that are viable in your deck part of your engine when you go first but they get stronger when you get second great examples recently naturia mole cricket card is a, a starter card when you go first card is good but card gets even better when you go second ecclesia the one that special summons its, itself from the hand when your opponent has more monsters great idea right haveness haveness card is part of your engine part of your deck when you go first it's not a brick it's just it's better when you go second right it makes your deck better when you go second cards like that purely the whole deck you know purely is like you have routes for going first and you have other routes for going second these types of designs i think are phenomenal and should be done a lot more right where um instead of having to draw or having to even put i don't like the fact that i have to put evenly matched into my main deck that's not a main deck card 
evenly matched shouldn't be a main deck card because that card is inherently high variance and frustrating. If I go first and draw evenly matched, it feels awful. When I win the, whenever I won the dice roll at YCS London in a deck that had like Kurikara and evenly in the main deck, I just had to every time I win the dice roll, I'm like, nice. I go first and I'm like, oh, dude, but what if I draw those cards? It feels so, it, it's, you know, but I have to play them because if I go second and I just play normal hand traps, they don't do enough. The decks are too powerful for that. Like, I'm not going to Ash Cash Tira and be fine. That's not, that's not how it works. So, yeah, all, all that, all that, um, I've been rambling again, but I just, I, I love talking about Yu-Gi-Oh like that, but like, it's, it's not hopeless, and that's why I think this is not, it's not all pessimistic. It's just um, pointing these things out, I think, is important to, if you're worried about the health of the game. Plus channel material. Oh, yeah. Hell, yeah. Evenly doesn't do anything to Furniture Lab. I mean, it's it's not really about that. It's just that they are encouraging, they are encouraging us to play cards that are not, uh, not very fun in my opinion. Yeah. At least for once, Konami Banlist design wasn't just smash the good old decks to pieces. I will say one thing. I feel like this current Banlist, this current Banlist feels like they have uh at least somewhat listened to what the community wanted. Um, and I don't often have that with um, with ban lists in the TCG. Like we've had good and we've had bad ban lists in the TCG, but most of the time it just feels like Konami doing its thing and kind of ignoring what everyone in the community is asking for. This time around, it felt a little bit different. It felt a little bit different. There were a couple hits on the last ban list that I feel like are not typical Konami ban list hits that um um you know normally you would expect them to not touch super heavy samurai and purely yet because those decks are very new and they wanted people to spend money on those decks yet they did right you i didn't personally expect them to ban a card like cyberstein that hasn't seen play recently the only reason that i wanted it banned was because it, it's a toxic card but they still did it right and they have uh even even banned stuff like Diablosis, which is like the number one like community ask was hitting Diablosis. Um, uh, branded Explosion too is like a card that wasn't even that strong. What if Konami adjusts the game rules, like put some limitations on how many times you can special summon per turn? So theoretically, theoretically um, possible. We've had that happen before. Um, that is something that I don't really have the data on. I've heard before that when they, when they made the last new master rule or the second last, the one where they limited how many times or how easy it was to summon stuff from the extra deck. I feel like overall that was not that bad of a change looking back, but, um, I don't think it worked out that well for them because they kind of went back on it. Right. I, I think, um, I think a master rule change is something that's possible. The question is, do people want that? Right? Because I think I think there are certain concepts that could theoretically work. Like also rotation is another thing that we've talked about before that I think is something that can work to uh to help Yu-Gi-Oh, right? But I think there's I think we are at a point with Yu-Gi-Oh where it's a little bit too late to do certain things like that. Because the Yu-Gi-Oh community just likes the game as it is right they don't want it to change fundamentally to be a basically a different game right they i don't think they want rotation i don't think they want new master rules all we want is uh cool cards that's i think that's what it is we want good cards and we want good ban lists because that's what we uh we can realistically expect some people want rotation i think the majority doesn't I am, I am in the camp of, I think rotation would be interesting. Um, I think it would be worth trying, but I think it would also be like financially and on all the other things considered, it would probably be too risky for Yu-Gi-Oh to try that. Because what if we get rotation and then just a lot of people quit the game because they don't want rotation. And then 
we maybe we have the greatest game ever but no one plays it anymore you know what's the point so i i think there are certain topics um that we just it's just pointless to talk about it at this point because i don't think they will happen um and i think uh it's probably better if they don't even though i personally think the idea of a rotation is intriguing i think it would be very interesting to see what would happen i think it's better if they don't risk it right because i think like whenever we talk about it there's so many people that don't want it um that it might it might just be too risky i don't want the game dying to set rotation but then you know you know um so I think what it comes down to is what I'm expecting and what I'm hoping for is just great bandless design and just better card design, right? Those are the two things. And I do think we're getting into a decent direction. I do think recently we've been getting less of those just way too powerful singular cards. We've been getting less like... Um, Omni negates is something that I've been feeling like has been less relevant recently. You know, I don't know. It's 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 just a gut feeling. I haven't actually like counted the number of Omni negates, but you know, Chaos Angel. I mean, look, Chaos Angel is a very good card, but it's not toxic. Uh, I don't think Chaos Angel is toxic at all. Like when I'm thinking of modern Yu-Gi-Oh problems, I am not, I'm not looking at Chaos Angel. This Potter negates, but this Potter's negate is not nearly as powerful as a gen generic Omni negate. Because it's only, uh, it only negates monsters, and it's only if your opponent has a banished monster. And it doesn't even destroy the card. Chaos Angel is a good example of a card that gets better going second, rather. I mean, yeah, if anything, Chaos Angel is like, okay, honestly. What I noticed recently is stat lines going up on generics. I mean, that's one other thing you can make cards better than previous cards. You don't necessarily have to give them like completely broken effects. You can also just make them stronger. Even though stats are probably the least important thingy in Yu-Gi-Oh! The least important quality of a card is its stats these days. But it is something, right? I mean, if, if there's some extra deck monster that's just super strong, that can also help, you know, out certain towers. Like, I think, for example, there could be... Uh, they could make a generic card that's just really, really strong. Like, uh, like just an idea that I just had. They could make a, they could make an extra deck monster that's like very high attack, but it just it doesn't deal damage to your opponent, so you can't use it to like easily kill your opponent. But you just use it to out uh, towers monsters, right? How have they not done that? You know, how have they not just, like, everyone has been struggling to out a rival at Ignister, uh, whatever other cards, and you just, all you need to do is just make a freaking, uh, make a freaking Link monster or whatever. That's just strong AF, but, um, you, you, it just doesn't deal damage to your opponent. Is it that hard? It can even be a freaking vanilla. Just make it a vanilla Link 2 that's just... In order to me to play... Okay, how strong, chat? How strong does a does a vanilla Link 2 have to be? Actually, vanilla would deal battle damage. Let's say it's a... It's, it has no effect other than... It has no effect other than it can't deal battle damage. How strong does it have to be for me to play that? I think the correct answer currently in Yu-Gi-Oh! is probably 3,100, because that beats over Baron. In current Yu-Gi-Oh!, that's probably where we're at. But then 3,100 wouldn't even out like towers. So it's kind of besides the point. But yeah. It's an interesting thought experiment. It's an interesting thought experiment, but yeah. I mean, uh, overall, I'm still... I think I think as much as Konami has proven that they can design unhealthy and unfun cards, they've also proven time and time again in the last couple of years that they can create fun formats as well, right? And that's always the light at the end of the tunnel, is that as uh, for as many bad formats I can think of, 
I can also think of so many good formats in the history of Yu-Gi-Oh! And not even, it's not like the last good format was like five years ago, right? That's not, that's just not remotely true. There's like multiple formats in the last couple years that were great, right? There was like um, the sprite and tier format, like Darkwing Blast, Power of the Elements, great format. Like uh, all those, like I didn't play through some of 2020 and 2021, but like Toss format was great um ishizu tier had had definitely had its advantages even though it wasn't perfect because it was tier zero um there's a lot of great examples of good Yu-Gi-Oh formats um and at the end of the day that's also very important to to think about that uh for all the bad examples you could you people always like to remember the bad things more than they like to remember the good things but they are also there right they are also there and i think Yu-Gi-Oh's future is by no means in danger i think it's completely it's gonna be fine they're gonna at some we're gonna have good formats we're gonna have bad formats um but i think it still is important to voice your concerns so that they potentially hear them and know what you want right uh they, they need to know what the community wants um whether they want to care about it or not that's on them but um, it's probably in their best interest to to listen to it, right? So I think having healthy discussions like that is is great.